Hello and a warm welcome to today's presentation on dysautonomia. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Andrea Cortez, who is an advocate for people with dysautonomia and a sufferer or her from his illness herself. Uh, when Andrea first got ill, she was barely able to walk up her driveway, and today she can manage a 30 minute walk and part time work. So she's been very successful at managing her condition, and I hope for quite extensive tips and tricks for management uh, that she's going to talk about today uh, help, help our listeners as well. So why I give this presentation, there is a lot of overlap between chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, and dysautonomia. Uh, if you suffer from things like POTS, orthostatic intolerance, uh, lightheadedness, nausea, low blood pressure, tachycardia, high heart rate, uh, brain fog even, there's a good chance you could also suffer from a degree of dysautonomia. Um, the overlap between these two illnesses is quite astounding, and you'll get to see that as Andrew goes out for our presentation. Uh, things like brain fog, even the treatments, the triggers, the high prevalence of misdiagnosis. These are all things that are common to both dysautonomia and ME-CFS. Uh, and just before I hand over to Andrea, we'll start. With, we'll go for a quick disclaimer. Um, this presentation is merely to disseminate information. It's not to make recommendations or directives. Uh, it should not be taken as medical advice suitable for everyone. And we strongly recommend that you discuss it fully with your chosen medical professional before uh, pursuing any treatment or management regime. So without further ado, I will hand over to Andrea. All right, so um, my name's Andrea, and I'm going to do a presentation on dysautonomia, particularly focusing on POTS in relation to chronic fatigue. Uh, um, dysautonomia is quite a hard word to say, so we usually say dysautonomia, and it's just an easy way to remember what it is. So um, in this presentation, what I'll cover is I'll go through what is dysautonomia, I'll talk about the autonomic nervous system, um, what are the causes of it, what are the symptoms, and how do you know if you might have it, and if you think you do have it, then where do you go from there, and after that, I'll go through the common treatments and strategies, uh, but before we get started, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass around this blood pressure monitor and pulse oximeter and you all should have a sheet where you can record your readings on there. Have you all got that sheet, the one with the colours on it? Yep, so I'm going to show you how to take your blood pressure. And what I suggest you all do is take your blood pressure recordings and heart rate recordings sitting down while I'm doing the presentation. So you can just pass it around and record it bit by bit. And then at the end, if you want to compare your readings sitting to standing, then you can come, come up and do it again at the end of the presentation. So when you use this, all you have to do is open it, put it on your arm, and you want to position it so that this wire is about an inch above the crease of your elbow and make sure it's on tight and then all you have to do is press the button and you keep your hand about the level of your heart and then it will take your recording and try and keep still when you're doing it I'm not going to bother doing a proper reading right now because it'll take too long uh, but the top number will be systolic blood pressure that's the top number bottom is diastolic and then the other reading is heart rate Take that off. If it runs out of battery, come and grab some batteries. I've got some spare ones. And the other thing I've got here is a pulse oximeter. And for this one, you just open it up, put your finger inside with your nail facing up. If you have nail polish on, it might interfere with the reading, so it might not be accurate. And you press the button. And give it about 30 seconds or more before it starts becoming accurate. You don't want to read it as soon as it appears on the screen. And it will tell you your heart rate is the top number if you hold it like in this direction towards you. And then the bottom number is your oxygen saturation level. So that's how much percentage of oxygen is in your blood. And the ideal number is 100%. This one only goes up to 99, but it as long as it doesn't drop below 92, it's okay. If it's below 92, it's not ideal. So I've got 112 and 90 at the moment. Okay. okay. 
Now, um, I just want to mention on the notes sheet that goes with the PowerPoint handouts, there is a disclaimer on there stating that nothing of what I say should be taken as medical advice. You should always discuss it with your specialist. Um, but this is just to give you all an idea of what you should be looking for. Okay, so what is dysautonomia? So it's an umbrella term which covers any disorder that affects the autonomic nervous system. And underneath that umbrella, there are different types of dysautonomia. The main ones that affect people who have chronic fatigue or ME are POTS, orthostatic intolerance, and neurally mediated hypotension. Now, all three of those types are quite similar in, in terms of symptoms, but the difference is with POTS, your heart rate will elevate. Um, so you're more likely to have um, dropping blood pressure if you have the hypotension. And orthostatic intolerance can actually cover the other two types as well. Um, and POTS stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So it's a bit to get your head around all those big long words. So what is the autonomic nervous system? It's basically what it is, is it controls everything automatic in your body. So all of those things your body doesn't think about, like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, um, temperature control, anything like that that you don't have to think about will be interfered with if you have dysautonomia. And that's a good diagram showing all of the areas of your body that it can interfere with or affect. So who gets it? So in general, dysautonomia is an umbrella term. Over 70 million people worldwide will have dysautonomia, which is more than MS and Parkinson's disease. Um, it doesn't discriminate by age or race. Anyone at all can get dysautonomia. Um, now, there's been a recent study done in the UK, and a lady I called Sarah, who I know, has done a series of infographics based on the results of the study. So if you see any of these images like this, I've used her images with permission. Um, so this is based on that study, and that showed that in the UK, 92% of people who had POTS were female, and 81% were aged between 18 and 39. Um, and in general, one out of 100 teenagers will get POTS. Um, not many people are aware of this. Um, and 27 to 30% of people with ME will have POTS, which is quite a large number when you think about it. The problem is it's commonly unknown about. Most doctors don't know what it is. Um, and they will tell you it's all in your head. So uh, you have to really come across a specialist who knows what it is. Okay, this is just an extra slide. I won't go through it. It's just some extra facts about POTS, which you can look at later on. Okay, so POTS in general, there are lots of different causes for POTS and other types of dysautonomia. So it has many causes since it's a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms. Some of the most common causes are post-viral. Um, sometimes it can be autoimmune disease. And a really common one is EDS, or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is joint hypermobility syndrome. So if you've got really hypermobile joints, you can put your thumb to your, to your wrist, you might be able to touch your tongue to your nose, or you might be really bendy and flexible. You could have something like that as an underlying cause, and it's often missed as, once again, doctors don't know what it is. Okay, so once again, from that UK study, there's lots of coexisting conditions that are quite common with POTS. 49% um, of people with POTS have EDS, which is that hypermobility syndrome I just mentioned. 37% will have low blood pressure. Um, a lot of people will have other diagnoses as well that aren't mentioned on this list. Um, but 29% of people will have chronic fatigue or ME, so it works both ways. 29% um, of people with POTS will have ME, and 30% of people with ME will have POTS, so it actually works both ways there. Um, fibromyalgia is also quite common to have. OK, 
Okay, so there's a specific criteria for getting diagnosed with POTS, and that states that um, your heart rate should jump at least 30 beats per minute or more on standing or within 10 minutes of standing. Um, for teenagers and adolescents, that can be that will be 40 beats per minute rather than 30. Um, or the other thing is it will be resting over 120 on standing, which is quite high. Um, just note that while it's quite common to have high or low blood pressure, it's not part of the criteria. So, you, uh, and lots of people think that you have to have low blood pressure when you stand to be diagnosed with POTS, but that's not true. Okay, so now's the parts you're probably really interested in hearing about is the symptoms. So the most common huge symptom in POTS is fatigue. So 91% of people will experience fatigue. Um, and 90% will experience dizziness, also palpitations, fainting or blackouts. And brain fog is a big one. And there's a lot of overlap of symptoms between ME and POTS, as you can see. Um, lots of people experience headaches. That coat hanger pain they mention is the muscles that go from the back of your neck inserting into your shoulders. It's really common for that um, to happen because of vagus nerve that runs through the back there. Um, and it's quite common to have gastrointestinal issues as well. So a lot of people will have um, nausea, bloating, or dysmotility, meaning the food basically just sits there, doesn't go through, and you can get your stomach can just balloon out, you look pregnant. Lots of people will have reflux disease, um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I have several of those things myself. Yeah, and also tingling or hands and feet. You can get um, chronic widespread pain. You can get tingling sensations in your different limbs. So it really affects a huge amount in your body. Um, and a lot of people have trouble with sleeping as well. And you can get night sweats. Um, you can get um, insomnia, all sorts because of that. And it's commonly mistaken as anxiety or depression because a lot of people will have high heart rate in this, so they'll feel jittery and anxious and they might have a tremor. So there's really a lot that can be going on there. I'm not going to read through this whole list of other symptoms, but there are a lot. So just you can have a read through these in detail later on, but tons and tons of symptoms that can present because it affects your whole body and everything automatic in your body. So that's a hell of a lot that can be affected. Okay, so this is a little diagram which shows what happens in a person's body when they have POTS. So in a normal adult, when you stand up, gravity will pull you know, 1.5 to 2 quarts of blood into the lower body. And as a result, your brain senses a sudden loss of that blood and it triggers a response. The heart rate beats faster, but not excessively. You know, it might just go 10 beats per minute more. And the heart beats with greater force and the vessels in the lower body constrict, which forces the blood back up to the brain and the vital organs. Um, but when a person with pot stands up, the same response is triggered so the heart beats faster, blood pressure might increase, um, or it might decrease in other people. But the problem is that the lower blood vessels don't constrict properly. So you get blood pooling in the limbs, which pulls it away from the brain and the other organs and can cause symptoms like fainting and dizziness. And it makes any other symptoms you have a lot worse. And basically the reason for that is that there's a problem in that autonomic nervous system, which is the center that controls that response. So it's, it's affected in a negative way and doesn't respond as it should. So if you think that all of this sounds like you, there are um, quite a few things we can, that you can do. I'll just go through a few facts first. This is once again from that UK study, so just note that the statistics in New Zealand will be a little bit different, and same with the USA, because um, it says for the for the UK it's an average of 3.7 years for a diagnosis, 
Whereas in the USA, it's more like five years, 11 months. And in New Zealand and Australia, it may be more like six to seven years, average time it takes to get diagnosed. But in saying that, I do know quite a few people who've gone you know, 20 years without a diagnosis. So it does really commonly get missed, which is unfortunate. Um, so in this study that was done in the UK, 48% of people had been previously misdiagnosed with a psychological or psychiatric disorder. And 75% of those people were female. So for some reason, people assume that females are more likely to have psychiatric disorders. Um, only 7% of GPs suggested the possibility of POTS. And I can vouch that even my GP had no idea what it was before I was diagnosed by a cardiologist. 20% um, of patients with POTS had to suggest the diagnosis themselves to a specialist. And the cardiologists were most likely to suggest POTS out of any specialists that people went to see. But even so, only 34% of cardiologists suggested it. So there's still a lot of ignorance in the field, even in even cardiologists, some don't necessarily know what it is, or they might know what it is, but don't know anything else about it, except the criteria, and that's it. Um, 75% had a diagnosis by having a tilt table test, which is a head up tilt table testing at the hospital. Um, and common things that people are told, which you've probably all heard in the field of chronic fatigue as well, things like you're just anxious, it's a panic disorder, obviously you're just depressed, you're a hypochondriac, you know, oh, you seem to just be attention seeking. It's really common for people to be told these types of things, unfortunately. Okay, so what do you actually do if you think you have POTS? Okay, so the first thing I'd recommend is compiling a list of all of your symptoms, even if you think they're unrelated, write down everything you can think of and try and categorize it into different groups. So you might have a list of your gastrointestinal um, symptoms, your temperature control symptoms, your um, symptoms to do with heart rate or anxiety. So just try and group them and put them in a, in a clear order so that it's ready for any specialist you go and see. Then the next thing I recommend is getting a blood pressure or heart rate monitor. Um, if you can't afford that, some pharmacies do free checks with a blood pressure monitor like that one. You can just go into the pharmacy and check it. The only downside there is you can't check it at different times of the day and also at different during different situations. Because um, what I recommend is keeping records of your blood pressure and heart rate and Try and check it different times. So you might check it on waking. You might check it in the middle of the day. You might check it after dinner or before you go to bed. Or maybe you've had a particular event or had a particular meal or food that you think flares you up, and you could check, you could check it after that and see what happens. Um, and I'd also encourage you to check it both lying down or sitting and then standing and see the difference. And as you said in part of the criteria, sometimes it can take up to 10 minutes of standing before the heart rate will increase. So it won't necessarily happen straight away. Um, and blood pressure isn't part of the criteria, but it's really good to know if you have coexisting low blood pressure or high blood pressure issues. Um, if you have high blood pressure, it can indicate a type of POTS called hyperadrenergic. And that's the type I have, and that means my noradrenaline or norepinephrine levels, if you've ever heard that word before, it's, it's similar to adrenaline. It's raised too high when I'm sitting upright or when I'm standing, and that will send my heart rate and my blood pressure up. Thanks. Um, now, there are particular ways you can keep record of your heart rate and blood pressure. Now, I might just get my phone so I can demonstrate. There is an app that you can di that you can download. Okay. So if you have a smartphone that has a flash on it, you can di you can not diagnose, download any app that checks heart rate. So I'll show you an example. You can see the screenshot of my one up there. It's called Heart Rate Monitor. 
And it works in a similar way to that pulse oximeter that I'm passing around the room, and that has little lights that basically see through your blood vessels. So, um, oh, my phone's being a bit annoying, saying preparing data. But all you do is it comes up with the flash, and you hold your phone over it, and it goes beep, 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 goes around in a circle, you hold it still, and then it gives you your heart rate reading, just like that. And if you download the version that is paid for, which is only about $6, then it will actually store your readings in there and it can show them in a graph. You can't obviously take your blood pressure using the phone. You can only take heart rate, but it's a really good way to monitor it. Um, my phone's deciding to prepare some data, so it's going to take forever, so I'm not going to bother. Yep, perfect. That's exactly what it is. Okay, so if you hold your finger on it, it goes around in a circle and then it shows you what your heart rate is on the screen. Okay, now the other thing you can download, you can see an example, a screenshot of the blood pressure monitor app in, the, in there. You can't actually take your blood pressure with a phone, but if you have a blood pressure monitor like the one that's been passed around, they probably cost about $60, $70 to buy one. And Omron is the best brand, it's the most reliable and you can you can register it and have warranty on it and you can get it serviced. Um, but if you take your readings, you can open the app, like the blood pressure monitor app, and it gives you an option to enter in the readings. So you can enter in systolic, diastolic, what the heart rate was, it automatically calculates pulse pressure, which is the difference between the top and bottom number. And also, you can enter in other readings, like your weight. You can enter in um, pulse oximeter, um, oxygen saturations. You can enter in blood sugar levels, like whatever you want. It allows you to put it in there. Um, and it just keeps your data in a way that you can view it on a graph and see what your patterns are. And it even gives you the option to select whether you were sitting, standing, or lying down when you took the reading. So it's quite useful if you want a way to keep track of your data and see patterns. Just in general, for an adult, it's normal for your heart rate to be in between 60 and 100 beats per minute, but even getting up to 90 is getting on the high side. It probably should sit between 60 and 80. Um, if you have a Fitbit, it will calculate your resting heart rate, which will um, take into account what your heart rate is when you're sleeping and during the day, and will calculate your resting your average resting heart rate as a result and so it is really useful to have something like a Fitbit because it has 24 hour heart rate monitoring you can see what your heart rate is real time on the screen um, it does take five minute averages so you may not it may not pick up random heart rate spikes so if your heart rate was to spike up really high to like 160 for a minute it might not pick that up but it does, it does um, have averages and it's a good way of seeing what your heart rate patterns are like. Okay, so um, I recommend probably keeping your that data for a month or two just to allow you to see what the patterns are like. And if you think that, that your data meets the criteria for this diagnosis, then get all of that data together in a way that you can show your specialist and take that list of symptoms and take it to your GP and ask for a referral to a cardiologist. If your doctor won't listen and says you're being a hypochondriac, there's no way you've got something else, find a new doctor, basically, because some doctors are just inflexible and unwilling to listen, so you need to find someone who is willing to support you through this process. That's really important because then you'll probably go back and need further referrals later on to other specialists and they need to be on board supporting you in that. And it's really important to be a self-advocate, really push for what you need. Do your research, go in there and say, look, I've got these symptoms which match this, I want this referral. So um, if you do have a Fitbit, it it um, can sync with data in your phone and it actually for each day shows a graph of the averages of your heart rate and you can see what zone it was in and how high it got. Um, so from mine, I, was, I had no idea how much my heart rate was running high until I had my Fitbit. Um, I could see that my heart rate was running in the what they call the fat burn zone, which is about over 95 beats per minute 
for about 12 hours of the day when I went to the specialist. So, yeah, it was quite helpful for me to see what was going on. But I also like took my own data and put it into graphs. But you can actually, if you have that blood pressure monitor app, you can export data. So you can um, send it to your email address and it exports it in different file formats. So you can actually access all of those graphs and, and make printouts of them. So it's really helpful. Okay, so um, I've got a list here of some recommended cardiologists. There are lots of cardiologists in Auckland who would probably do a really good job. Um, just the specific ones that I know lots of people go to see are the cardiologists at Auckland Heart Group and in particular um, the, the cardiologists Fiona Stewart, Warren Smith and Tim Sutton have experience with dysautonomia. Um, you can go through the public system to see a cardiologist or any specialist, it just takes a lot longer. And also you're taking, you would take the risk um, that the specialist you see may not be that knowledgeable in dysautonomia. So that would mean you'd have to really up your game in terms of being a self-advocate and really um, spelling out what your symptoms are, what you want, what tests you want and everything. Um, I mean, some of them may be competent and know, but there are maybe some that don't. So it's just know that you run that risk if you do go through the public system. Um, another option could be if you do see a cardiologist who's not that familiar with it, you could you know, very politely suggest that they liaise with the cardiologists at Auckland Heart Group who've been mentioned. I know Fiona Stewart is really willing to help others so, and she has um, liaised with people in other parts of the country if they're unable to get to the specialist in Auckland. So that's always an option as well. So um, if you do go to the cardiologist, there's a certain um, number of tests they might run on you in your initial visits. The initial one they would probably do would just be a normal ECG, which is an electrocardiogram. They just put little sticky things on your chest in different specific spots, and it measures your heart rate patterns, and they're looking for anything abnormal there. Um, another one they might do is a Bruce Colt protocol treadmill test, which sounds awful to everyone, but they get you to, once again, wear sticky things on you, stand on the treadmill, and they look at your tolerance to the exercise and also how your heart recovers from the exercise afterwards. So if you think that's going to send you into a crash of symptoms, make sure you plan your appointment for some time when you're going to have time to recover from it. Um, they might get you to do, well, they probably will actually get you to do a 24-hour halter monitor. That's that one in the middle there, where you wear a thing around your neck, which looks quite similar to this thing I've got around my neck here, actually. And then they have stickies attached to you, and you do have to wear it for 24 hours, and it monitors your heart rate continuously for that time. And you're not allowed to have a shower or anything during that time. So once again, if you have to have a shower in the morning, go to work or something, you might not want to do it on that particular day. So um, it is a bit uncomfortable to wear to bed, it's a bit of a pain, but it's only 24 hours of your life and it's worth it to get some answers. They can't actually diagnose POTS from that test, they can see whether they think your heart rate follows a pattern that might suggest POTS or other types of dysautonomia, but they won't actually give you the diagnosis from that test. Um, in order to get the diagnosis, most people will have to have a tilt table test at the hospital. Now, even if you go through private therapy, you still have to go to the hospital to get the tilt table test done. So like I went through Auckland Heart Group, but I had to wait three months in the public system to have the tilt table test at Auckland Hospital. So, um, and during that time, I de deteriorated quite significantly. Like when I was first really sick, I was... Um, barely able to stand for more than 30 seconds. I'd feel like I was going to pass out and, you know, I was often crawling around my apartment and everything. So I was putting up with all of that for three months before I had that test and started getting some treatment. That was quite difficult. Um, and the tilt table test, what they do is they lie you on a table and you tilt your, um, I think you have to lie there for about 20 minutes from memory, and then they will tilt you up to a specific angle and you're strapped into this table, and they will monitor your heart rate and blood pressure during this time. And 
it actually tries to elicit a faint. So if you're a fainter, you may faint on the table. So if you do faint, they would stop the test immediately. If they're not getting what they want from the test, they may inject you with an extra... Um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure exactly what it is, but they inject you with something, which flares you up a little bit more so they can get what they're looking for. And it will probably last a maximum of 45 minutes, but it could be over within half an hour. So it's not the most pleasant of tests. So once again, it may make you crash with your symptoms and you may want to organise this for, um, or at least organise to have a bit of time off work if you do work or something like that. It just, it's really up to you. A lot of people will choose to flare up their symptoms before the test just so that it actually shows what you want it to show so you can get the diagnosis. Okay, so once you have a diagnosis of POTS or another type of dysautonomia, there may be other specialists that you might be required to see. This will be totally dependent on what your symptoms are. So if you have gastrointestinal symptoms, um, you might have to see a gastroenterologist. Um, if you have pain symptoms or um, swelling or burning in your extremities, things like that, or um, Raynaud's type symptoms, you might have to see a rheumatologist. They will also deal with autoimmune type issues. Um, an immunologist might, um, you might see if you've got allergies or you think you might have mast cell disorder as an underlying cause for your POTS. Or, um, and sometimes people see a neurologist to rule out neurological causes for POTS. Um, it's quite uncommon to have a neurological cause, but it is, it is possible. So you can have things like um, Chiari malformation in the brain. You might have um, MS or something like that. Um, and I, because I was getting neurological type symptoms and that I had tremor all the time and I was getting tongue fasciculation. So if I stick my tongue out, it will kind of, um, the muscles will go like this and shake. But I was very relieved to have anything neurological ruled out. So even though it was quite expensive, it was worth just ruling it out for me. And there are lots of other specialists you might see, like you might have to manage your condition by changing your diet. You know, some people um, will follow a paleo diet, some people will go low FODMAP, some people will do like a plant-based diet, like it really depends on the person, what's suitable for you. But a lot of people find that diet makes a huge difference to symptoms, um, especially sugar and carbs are huge triggers, and also like before we said caffeine, alcohol. So a lot of people have to cut those things out. Um, to manage symptoms. Um, you might see an occupational therapist to help you get equipment. You might see a physiotherapist to help you manage that um, exercise. And once again, it's going to be really difficult if you have coexisting ME, chronic fatigue, because that can um, further complicate your tolerance to exercise. Um, but sometimes you have to change your perspective of what exercise means. Like for some people, exercise could mean something as simple as lying on a bed, learning to tense and relax specific muscles, and, it, and then you might just um, build up really basic strength-based exercises over time in a recumbent position. Like I was quite shocked when I started physiotherapy because um, I'd been trying to um, get back into exercise by doing this Pilates DVD I'd always done in the past, and I was... I had no idea why every single time I would crash for about two weeks, unable to do it again. And I was getting really frustrated. And I was quite shocked when I started seeing physiotherapists through rope neuro rehab. Um, I had them come to my house. And they got me starting lying on the floor, learning to clench a muscle in my abdomen. And that was as basic as I started. And that was a bit of a shock for me, knowing what level I was at. And then I had to build that up really slowly over time. Then I bought a recumbent exercycle and I could barely do two minutes when I started. Now I can do 30 minutes, no problem. Um, and over time I did build up my tolerance to being up, upright because doing the bike and the strengthening exercises can strengthen the blood vessels in your legs and it will encourage blood flow back up to the heart and brain. Um, and over time I did build up that upright tolerance and then they got me doing Nordic walking. And so now I can do... Um, 30 minutes Nordic walking through Cornwall Park and before when I started I could barely walk up and down my driveway and I was having to walk with a cane so you know can't come a long way and it can really help but it's really hard if you can't afford physiotherapy because it's not easy to get funded 
So if you do have um, limited finances, it can help to find someone who's willing to help support you through it, because it is worth it. Uh, Nordic walking is um, a specific type of, of walking that comes from Europe, and you have two specially designed poles um, with rubber tips on the end, and you walk kind of in a normal pattern. You have the poles in your hand, and you swing your arms in a normal um, natural way, but when you get to this like, about 45 degree angle, you push off from behind, and you have to keep your arms straight. And you there's a particular technique to um, moving your waist and try not to move your shoulders or tense them up. You have to breathe properly. But when you do this particular type of walking, it uses about 90% of the muscles in your body, so it actually strengthens your body as you're walking. Um, and it's quite and it's low impact exercise, so it's often used for people who have like neurological disorders. Um, so I was taught how to do it by the physiotherapist, and you have to get order the poles through a physiotherapist. Like they would do an assessment with you, teach you how to do the technique, and then they would um, help you order the poles. Um, well, I've I've specifically gone to rope neuro rehab or rehabilitation. They're based in um, Sandringham, just off Dominion Road, and um, while they specifically see people with neurological disorders, um, because the symptoms of POTS are so similar, they did accept me and take me on board and they knew what it was, and it's just really nice because the people in the class really get it. There's no expectations for you to try hard and push yourself against other people in the class, and they understand that you know, you might have a bad week and you might be fatigued and hardly able to do anything. And another week you might be doing really well and progressing through the exercises. And they they get that, they understand, and they will tailor it to your individual levels. And they can do one-on-one -on -one sessions and they also do um, Pilates classes. I go along once a week. I still go to the neuro Pilates class that they run. Um, so and I quite enjoy it because it's just no pressure you know, like if you go along to a normal yoga or Pilates class, they will expect you to do all the same exercises as exercises as everyone else, and they won't understand if you're having a fatigued day or just unable to come, or you know, or um, unable to push yourself to do more on that particular day. So, so there are there are places out there where they you just have to um, really look around and find somewhere who understands or know it. if they know what your condition is, it's a good start means they're open-minded to look into it. Okay, so the top treatments that you'll come across for POTS, the first thing they'll probably tell you to do, which is actually quite similar to what they recommend for ME, is to increase your salt and water intake. Um, but the reason they do that is because people who have POTS will usually have low blood volume. So um, by having 2.5 litres of water a day and... 8 to 10, I think it's 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 grams of sodium a day, that will increase and boost up your blood volume, which will, once again, return venous blood return to the brain and organs, um, rather than it pooling so much. Um, people will be sceptical and say, oh, you know, but won't it increase blood pressure? But the thing is, you know, in a normal person, they already have normal blood volume, so they don't need the extra boost of blood volume. And if they do have too much salt, then their blood pressure will go high as a result. Whereas in POTS, it's just going to be helping to boost it back up to a more normal state. So, you know, it's not going to do that. And if you if you do find it sends your blood pressure high, then you're going to know maybe it's not that suitable for you if it only goes high after you do that. Um, another um, thing that people often do is wear compression stockings. And for POTS, it's recommended to have waist-high um, full-length compression stockings and quite high medical grade compression which is, they recommend 30 to 40 mmhg which is a measurement of how much compression and lots of people find they can't tolerate that because it's quite tight and um, most people will wear 20 to 30 mmhg who I know like these ones are, these are actually compression stockings believe it or not and you can get nice looking ones from the states um, you don't have to get ugly old people skin colour ones. <laughs> um, so these ones are 20 to 30 mmHg, and I actually buy maternity ones because I get that stomach distension, and I know a lot of people 
her bi maternity ones because it because some people just can't cope with that compression on your stomach. Um, I put a lot of information in the notes about the compression stockings, but I wouldn't recommend just going and buying them. I would recommend getting a diagnosis first and having it as a re medical recommendation because it can do damage if you don't need them. So, um, but the whole point of them is once again to increase the blood return from your lower legs up to your vital organs and your brain. Um, and it just helps with the circulation and I've found they've made a huge difference to me. Um, if I if it's really hot, I just cannot wear the full length ones. It's just way too hot. So I, even in summer, I will still wear compression stockings, but I will just wear knee high ones. And you, and I always buy open toe so that I can wear them with um, jandals if I want to. And I get these things called half socks, which I ordered off the internet, which are literally half a sock. And I wear them over the top if I want to wear clothes and shoes or I just wear normal socks over them. So, but there's a lot of information. There is a New Zealand supplier of the um, Juzo Soft brand that I recommend, um, but they're quite expensive. They're called Tumac Solutions. I think they're actually based on the North Shore. But um, they can help you with getting the measurements right. It's really important to get the measurements right, and it can be quite confusing online. Um, it's most important to get the ankle measurement correct for the right level of compression. So they can help you get the right fit. Um, but if you order, say, a pair of Juzo Soft, which is the best brand that is the most comfortable, if you order it through them, it will be over $200 for a pair. So, But you can get them for about $110 a pair from the USA online, and I always do. A, um, but, but there are other cheaper brands out there. They just might not be as comfortable. So you can have a go at getting other cheaper brands. It's just um, everyone I know buys the Juzo Soft ones just because they're so comfortable and they don't pinch as much behind the knees. Yep. So um, part of POTS treatment that's recommended, as I've discussed, is a graded exercise program, but it's usually recumbent exercise that is recommended, not upright, and because that's going to reduce that blood pooling. And, and when you are upright, your body's going to have to work extra hard to get that blood back up to your vital organs in your brain. So it's going to put extra pressure on your body. So it's when people don't really know what they're doing and try and push it too far that that's when you end up crashing. And if you do crash after doing exercise, you know that what you're doing is too much. Even if even if you're in your mind, you think you should be doing more than what you're doing. It's It's really you have to change your mindset about what you're capable of doing. Um, lots of people will change what their eating patterns to have smaller frequent meals because like, I found once I got pots all of a sudden if I ate a big meal I was used to having you know three big meals a day I could eat dinner then all of a sudden I'd just start getting like distended stomach and I, and it would feel like the food would just sit there and there's no room for anything else and you get breathless heart rate would go up you get flushing episodes um, so I found out over time that you do actually have to reduce it down to small frequent meals. If you eat small amounts, your body can cope with it better. And that's because your body is basically drawing all the blood to the stomach and pulling it away from everything else. And it will increase symptoms. Um, and lots of people find that carbs and sugars are a big tr um, trigger. So we'll have to reduce those down. Like I found a huge difference by following a paleo diet. Um, now these treatments, the focus of them is to expand your blood volume, so how much blood in your body, um, reduce reduced um, heart rate, um, and there are some drugs that can be used for those things as well, like a lot of people will take fludrocortisone or Florinef is another name for it, to increase your blood volume. Um, it does make you retain fluid and sodium. Um, I personally didn't agree with that drug, but a lot of people find it like a miracle drug. It you know, makes a huge difference to their symptoms. Same with another one called Midadrine. That's a vasoconstrictor, which means basically having a compression effect in your body without the actual compression. So it's constricting everything. So some people find a combination of those two are amazing, especially people who faint or find a huge difference from that. Um, there are drugs like ivabradine, um, beta blockers, peridostigmine, which can reduce heart rate. Unfortunately, ivabradine is not available in New Zealand. You can only get it in Australia. 
So you'd have to actually source it from a pharmacy in Australia if you wanted that one. But lots of people take a low dose beta blocker and find a huge difference. The beta blockers also help in reducing the adrenaline like symptoms. So if you're um, constantly, you know, a shaky, trembly mess and getting sweaty and, you know, it can make a big difference to all those symptoms and also help you to sleep better as well as a result. Beta blockers is usually to reduce blood pressure, but in POTS it's used for lowering heart rate. A lot of the drugs used for POTS are not specifically designed for POTS, but they're usually used to treat other things, but they've been effective in treating POTS. Take drugs that reduce blood pressure, and you might have to go with other options. So you might not be able to take a um, beta blocker. Um, there are other drugs too, like I'm on clonidine, which is really helpful for hyperadrenergic type of POTS because it kind of levels out the noradrenaline levels and reduces blood pressure. So if you've got high blood pressure and raised noradrenaline levels, that a lot of people find that drug really helpful. So there's lots, basically the point is, there are a lot of drugs that are available that can help. They're not all on that list there, but there are a lot out there. Um, I mean, some people even take like SSRIs, but some people find that there's too many side effects to make those worth it. So it really just depends on the individual person, the recommendations of your specialist. But in saying that, do investigate each drug and what it does and be informed before you see the specialist because you can make suggestions to them about what you want to take. And for that, it's really useful to join like online forums for like POTS and dysautonomia and discuss it with other patients who've been through it because it's really, really helpful in getting um, people's perspectives on how it helped, what kind of side effects there were, and how many people it helps. So I found that really useful. Now, in emergency situations, it's really helpful to have um, one litre of saline solution over one hour. The problem is it's really hard to access. People will, I don't know why, but in hospitals, they're really reluctant to give you saline, unless it's like the end of the world type thing. Like you have to have, you have to go in there pretty much fainting, really severely sick before they will give you saline. So it's only used in emergency situations, and even if you go to the ED, they won't always give you the saline. So it's better to have it arranged through a specialist if you're that severe. They might actually be able to arrange a treatment plan for you if you go into the emergency department. So. Yeah, it can be a real pain because it, because it's um, proven to help and it especially reduces brain fog. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of um, strategies that can help manage symptoms, um, not even just for POTS but other conditions related as well. You might find some of these useful for yourself even if you don't have POTS. Um, I didn't bring in my cane seat, but I've got a cool cane seat in the car and a cane. It's, but um, you can get things like those from places like the Independent Living Service, which is based in Royal Oak. I think there is actually a um, similar place out this way somewhere in Albany. But I can't remember what it's called. Um, there's also the East Disability Building, which they might have some equipment. Um, but it's just useful because I find the cane seats I useful because I get... I get dizzy if I stand in one spot for too long, so I take it to the supermarket and if I just stand in a queue, I can sit on it. I don't care if I get stared at, it's just it's really helpful. And You can get different types as you can see. Um, I used to require a cane for walking because I had balance and stability issues. I don't so much anymore since doing physio. Um, I, you can get some of this equipment funded through an OT if you see a, um, like an occupational therapist. Like I got a funded shower chair, I got a wheelchair funded and a pressure cushion. They got me a um, hospital mattress because I was in chronic pain at one stage and like couldn't even sit without my tailbone hurting, couldn't lie on my shoulder. I was getting nerve pain everywhere. But you, you can get some funded. I also got a little table on wheels for my kitchen because at one stage I couldn't lift my arms up. I was too fatigued and weak to lift my arms up to the bench to cut if I was sitting because I keep an office chair in my kitchen wheel around on it because I get dizzy standing there um, and I really struggled to prepare any food because I couldn't hold my arms up so they got me a table on wheels for my kitchen um, now it's more used as a storage place for equipment because I don't need it anymore but so OT can help you find equipment that's suitable for your condition as well it does help obviously to have the diagnosis first because then they're more likely to 
um, be able to get funding for you. I was really lucky to get the wheelchair funded. It, was it really, it's all decided by a computer system. It's done through a place called Access Able. It's called Enable, I think, in the low, lower half of the North Island and in the South Island, top half of the North Island up access able and an OT does an assessment with you and goes through all the criteria and then they basically have to put it in the computer system. The computer calculates whether you meet the criteria compared to how much funding they currently have available to determine what equipment you can get and unfortunately because it's all done by computer you can't like do the reassessment or the, it can't be over overrided by a human so it's a bit you know I'm, I, it's not really the ideal because um, some people who really might desperately need a wheelchair might get funding if they, might not get funding if they don't have much funding at that specific time they have the assessment done. So I do consider myself lucky. I only use the wheelchair for um, events like concerts and um, shows like at the showgrounds or going through the airport because I just can't stand for a long time, and it's allowed me to do those things where I may not have been able to, able to go otherwise. So it's been really helpful for me. And you really have to get your head around using this stuff as well and get past the what people think of you. It's, it takes a lot of courage. Um, you can also, I found a mobility parking permit really useful. Once again, there's a lot of issues there because you're afraid people will abuse you for using it. And there is a lot of that out there. I haven't personally experienced it, but I know a lot of people have been abused because they've been judged for using it when they look normal. And but it's just it really makes a big difference. It took me ages to accept that actually I deserved to use it because I thought, oh, what if somebody you know with who can't get out of their chair comes along? And I thought, well, actually, if I walk that little bit further, it's going to contribute to my fatigue levels, make me crash. Whereas if I use it, it just it means I can do more in a day and function better. And if I do have a dizzy spell, I can get out quickly to the car. Um, now there's other little th um, cool things you can buy. So um, I've got a lot of cooling devices from an Australian company called Arctic Heat. Um, I've got cooling tyres. I can actually pass some around. I've got a couple more so you can feel what they feel like. The white one's significantly more cold. That one's not from the company. The blue ones are. But this one's more ugly. So I'll pass them around so you can feel them. But you can actually use these hot or cold and they help to cool down your body temperature. Um, from them I also got I keep them in the fridge. I find that they're too cold in the freezer because on your neck it's just too cold. Whereas I have a cooling vest that I've bought from them also. And if you email them before purchase saying you have a medical condition, need it for medical reasons, they will actually give you a discount on the vest. They do them in a white colour. They're ugly. They do the, the white one looks like a cricket vest. I've, um, I've got a white one and a blue one. And I often, in summer, I wear this so I can work. If I don't wear this, I cannot work because I have I can't regulate my body temperature and I get overheated. So I just tell people I need this to cool down my body temperature because it won't do it itself. And people just accept it. They're like, okay, I just have to accept that it's ugly. And I, you can't really get any better better looking ones. You can if you order it from the states, but you can't be sure about what type of vest it is and whether it's reliable. Whereas they've done actual proper testing and they've made these specific for people who have medical conditions like MS and also people who do sports or work in industry can find them useful as well and they cool down your body temperature. Now I keep my vest in the freezer and they have these um, gel pouches which freeze into ice and they're specifically placed so that they're not dangerous, like they don't have any on the lower back because they don't want to cool down your kidneys. Yep, so they're specifically designed. If you find it too cold in the freezer, you can keep it in the fridge. It just doesn't stay cold for as long. So I'll pass that round as well. Most people's instant reaction is, oh, it's so heavy, but when you put it on, you don't really feel that weight as such. I mean, anyone who wants to try it on, feel free. Um, you can do that. What's that, sorry? Um, I think a cooling vest probably a couple of hours before it starts warming up. Oh, oh, as long as you, yeah, you, as they last pretty much as long as, until, unless you cut a hole in the pocket and the gel falls out, they will last a long time. Um, and you, they actually come in a non-activated state, so they have little um, 
granules in the pockets that just feel like little grains and you soak it in water to activate it and then they swell up to the gel. Then you dry them out and then once the material's dry then you can keep it in the freezer or in the fridge. Yep, and you can use them for heating as well. And I've got one more from them, which is, yeah, so they can be put in the microwave. They give you instructions on how to do it. And I also got um, knee wraps because I also have um, erythromyalgia, which is burning extremities. So I get like burning in my feet, knees, hands, shoulders, chest, face, ears. Mostly under controlled medication now, but I still get burning in my knees. So I've got these knee cooling wraps done by the same company. I've got a couple of them. I'll just pass around one. So um, they're just really helpful. But yeah, so if you're a person who gets overheated easily or um, or cold really easily, they can be really helpful for your body temperature. Um, so. Heat um, can be a big trigger for POTS symptoms because heat will dilate the blood vessels and, open, and in POTS your blood vessels are already dilated or expanded too much as it is. And when heat comes along, it opens them up even more so it increases symptoms like dizziness and flushing and high heart rate. Um, the same, you will get the same effect from alcohol as well. So it will um, affect you in that way. But your yeah, heat is a huge trigger for POTS. So a lot of people can't cope with heat very easily. And um, it can make it really difficult to stay upright. Um, I've got a couple more fancy things in this bag to show you as well. So I've got these cooling mats. These ones do not have to be put in the fridge or freezer. These ones just have a substance in them which is cooling if you sit on it or lie on them. And if I overheat, say at night, um, I can get this out and lie on it in the bed if the bed gets too hot because I sometimes have like night sweats and stuff. So um, these ones come from a company called Innovations, these ones that are a bit heavier. Um, and they're a bit more expensive, but they can do pillow size ones and big ones. And I've got all the links to these and the references. That one I got from Bunnings for about $30, $20 or $30. It's a pet gel cooling mat, but it works just as well. So, um, but yeah, these ones are just a bit better. The cooling effects last a bit longer, but that one's more comfortable. So I'll pass this one around this way. <laughs> it's quite heavy. Yeah, they are. They are quite heavy. <laughs> yeah, so those. So those are just like lots of little things that can help. And I've, hi I've highlighted some of the specific references. I've put them in bold um, just to say um, what they're for and that these are the ones you might specifically want to look at. So definitely um, one of the key sources of information is Dysautonomia International and also the um, Dynet Network, um, which is for young people with POTS internationally. And there's some other links to some other pages and also the link to that blog who's done by that lady, Sarah, who's done all the infographics. Um, that's a good one to look at if you want to understand POTS in an easy to understand way. Okay, so um, just for this, yeah, I've been asked about if it's normal to get really cold extremities as well as hot. So not, not everyone who has POTS will have those symptoms, but they are commonly co-occurring. So a lot of people do have the icy cold extremities. I actually get both. Some people will have erythromyalgia, the burning extremities, and Raynaud's together. So Raynaud's is um, often referred to for the cold extremities. Um, but it also it can just be a byproduct of having dysautonomia or POTS because the circulation is not necessarily as good. And if you've um, done something like had a big meal or um, or your body's just having a slow day, it will be working extra hard to pump the blood around your body. And as a result, it may not get to your extremities because it's trying to focus all that blood towards your vital organs in your brain. So that can um, contribute towards it as well. Yeah, so if you've got low blood volume and then your body's working extra hard to try and keep those vital organs in your brain going, you may find that the circulation doesn't get to your extremities so easily. Um, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, so um, POTS is actually um, likened to an adrenaline-like response. So it's um, related to the fight-flight response. So a lot of the symptoms will be similar to what you would get if you were in a fight-flight situation. Um, a lot of the symptoms also, like anybody in the normal population could experience any of those symptoms if their body was put under um, harsh conditions. It just, in POTS, your body will experience all of those symptoms under normal conditions that other people would not experience any of those symptoms. But if their body was put under extreme conditions, they would probably experience a lot of those symptoms too because it puts pressure on the autonomic nervous system to regulate everything. So it's more um, like in these kind of um, dysautonomia disorders, there's a dysregulation of those autonomic nervous system and it's not functioning as it should. So and it will either be over or underactive in the um, parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, and if you go back, if you go back to one of the ones at the beginning, you can see this. I'll just show you this one here. So everything you see on that diagram can be affected. So yeah. Yeah, so um, that's why you can get so many symptoms. You have like two pages of symptoms and go to the doctor and they tell you, you can't possibly be experiencing all those symptoms, you know. I remember before I was diagnosed, my doctor would look at me like I was crazy, like you can't possibly have all those symptoms. And ever since I was diagnosed, she's been so nice to me. Like, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's quite complicated actually because I, I don't know exactly when it started because I've had signs of being sick since 2010. You know, it started with just things like temperature control issues and um, getting like reflux, but that was the extent to it. And then I was fine apart from that. And then in 2012, I had a random episode of reactive arthritis. So my knees swelled and um, no one really knew what caused it and I was on crutches for a few weeks and it took about six months to recover from that till I could walk properly. Then it happened again at the beginning of 2013 and I had a random episode of hyperthyroidism and they called it silent thyroiditis. Once again no one knew what caused it um, and it got better on its own over a few months but when I had that thyroid episode that's when my heart rate started being raised and no one could explain it. Everyone thought that the thyroid caused the high heart rate. So they said, oh, it will get better when your thyroid gets better. But the thyroid improved and the heart rate never recovered. It was always up high. So I was on beta blockers right from then. And then um, went through a big trauma in the middle of 2013, emotional trauma. And I suspect that may have triggered off my condition to get a lot worse. And after that, in the later half of the year, I started getting the dysmotility episodes where my stomach would balloon out and I'd look pregnant. And no one, once again, could explain it. And I went to endocrinologist and she didn't know what it was. She thought I had Cushing's disease, but it wasn't. And then she put it down to insulin resistance from PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, because I, I have PCOS as well. And then she kind of said, oh, well, you know, can't explain it it's just to do with that and then she encouraged me to go off beta blockers which I'd tried to go off twice and my heart rate had gone high so I went off them I was actually all right for a few months and then beginning of 2014 I had been um, getting back into exercise you know to recover from the arthritis and I've been strengthening my knees been going on big walks and one particular day around Western Springs I thought oh no, I'm getting really fit. I might try five minutes of jogging because I used to do jogging when I was really well. And I thought, okay, I'll just ease into it slowly. And then that night, every time I stood up, I could feel my heart rate jumping high. So I panicked and thought, what's going on? I had to call my partner to take me to A&E. And they said, you know, this is not normal, but it's not life-threatening. And they told me to get a referral to a cardiologist. So then I went to my GP and said, look, this happened. I need a referral to a cardiologist. And she kind of was like, oh, okay, gave me the referral and then went there. And he said, oh, I've never seen anyone with this before, but I think you've got this thing called POTS. So 
I was like, okay. And I had actually, funnily enough, Googled my symptoms. Um, I'd Googled heart rate jumping on standing and it'd come with I'd come up with POTS and I thought, there's no way I've got this thing that I've never heard of. But it turns out I did, but it took me three months to get the official diagnosis because even though he'd done all those other initial tests and said, oh, yeah, it looks like it probably is POTS, they couldn't confirm it until I had that tilt table test. And then, yeah, after that point, like across March to June 2014, my symptoms all just deteriorated. Like I was so fatigued that I would, I don't know how I even managed to keep working. I was working in private therapy so I could manage my own hours and caseload, which was a blessing. I probably would have had to give up working altogether. Um, but I'd see a client go home, sleep for two hours, and then could barely get out of bed. I have to drag myself to see the next one. And I'd be having like um, sleep um sleep paralysis attacks you know where you would be awake but can't move things like that and um often had to have naps in my car just to get through the day like and I had such bad brain fog like that a few times I actually forgot where I was when I was driving even if I was around the corner from my house you know and it was so bad in my apartment I was actually having to crawl around because I couldn't stand up properly I couldn't stand up to do my teeth or my makeup or anything so I lost all of that functioning ability within a matter of a few months. Like previously I'd had all the symptoms underlying and I was never fully well, but I could at least function, even though it was difficult. Whereas when it got to this, I just, I could barely even stand. And I could drive because I was all right sitting. It was the standing that was the problem. Um, but, you know, just to go into a client's house, I'd have to get out of the car, really quickly walk inside with the cane, sit down, and then I'd be sitting there with clients doing a session. My head would be spinning, and like, it was just awful. And then, um, I, you know, across the year, it progressed, and I got all the chronic pain symptoms. So I had the um, widespread musculoskeletal pain. So I had it all in my arms and legs. Couldn't sit without my tailbone hurting. Couldn't lie on my shoulders. Like, it was impacting my everyday functioning. Then the erythromyalgia developed, the burning. Like I'd had burning in my knees since 2009, but I'd, that's all it had ever been and no one could explain it and I didn't think much of it. But since I had the POTS, it developed, it spread and it's to all of my extremities. And then that started interfering with my functioning. And then there was all the gastrointestinal issues like the reflux disease, dysmotility, IBS. So it just, you know, progressed and to all these horrible symptoms and then it's taken me couple of years to get it all under control with medications um, following all those protocols and lifestyle strategies and you know I'm not cured I'm still unwell I don't you know I, I still have symptoms every day but I can function you know, 100 times better than I could a couple of years ago so that's all right yeah I'm sure <laughs> you've 